times. Okay. Well, good morning. Please pray with me. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here and worship you this morning. We pray now that we would be excited about learning from your revelation in the Bible. I was excited in Sunday school with the high schoolers this morning to study, and now we get to study a little more, and we're in the Gospel of John, and we're going to talk about a miracle today. Help us, Lord, to sense the magnificence, the majesty involved in a miracle like this. Help us to understand what it means and to help our understanding change who we are and how we live. We pray that you would build us up this morning and that we would sense that you are with us and that you would make the words clear in our minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 2, if you want to turn there in your Bible. And while you're turning, let me ask you to consider something. What if God gave you the ability to do miracles? Now, my understanding from the Bible is if God were to give you the spiritual gift of miracles, it would all remain under God's control. It would be God doing the miracle through you. But let's suppose for one time, just like God gave Solomon one desire... God would let you do one miracle of your choosing. How would you announce this new ministry of yours? What miracle would you want to do? Anybody want to share? None of you would want to do a miracle. Wow! You know, I've preached this sermon in maybe five churches, and you're the first ones that never wanted to do a miracle. You would want to love as God loves. You'd make everybody love that way? Just for you to do it. <laughs> so at least everyone who knew you would be very impressed. All right, that's very good. Anybody else? What miracle would you want to do for your one miracle? Cure cancer. That's a good one. Anyone else? Shy, shy people. Well, I'll tell you, the two suggestions we had are very compassionate and altruistic because I was thinking of something a little more dramatic. I was thinking I would stand here and while the cameras are rolling, whoosh, hair would grow out of my head, right? Something bold. Well, what Jesus did for his first miracle, his declaration of his identity and his ministry was very different. It was subtle. It was a whisper not a shout. Only a few realized that it even happened, and fewer understood. And that makes it all the more interesting to ask, what does this miracle mean? So let's take a look at our scene today, and we'll see if we can figure out what is the significance of this miracle. We are in John chapter 2. Well, that would be the on switch. There we go. John chapter 2, verse 1. Now on the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. So we saw last week Jesus was heading west into Galilee, kind of like his home county. And now we see that he was heading to Cana for a wedding celebration. And he arrived on the third day, which could mean two or three days after he started because the Jews sometimes counted the beginning day. Now let's review a quick timeline here. John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. Jesus went off into the wilderness by himself for 40 days. After that, the Pharisees sent some priests and Levites to question John the Baptist of what he thought he was doing, telling people to repent and baptizing them in the Jordan River. Over the next two days, John the Baptist identified Jesus as the Lamb of God, as the Messiah, the Deliverer for Israel. At least two of John the Baptist's disciples followed Jesus. 
Jesus picked up a few more, at least six that we know of altogether, and he headed off to Cana in Galilee. Now, you can see Cana here on the map. It's about nine miles from Nazareth, which is where Jesus grew up. And like Nazareth, Cana was an insignificant rural village. So maybe a little bit like Whitewater. I mean, we like living here, but it's rural, it's small, and we can't really say we're too significant in the course of state or national events, right? But look at this picture of the likely spot for Cana. We can see that it was right on the edge of a fertile plain, right at the start of the foothills. So these people, they were living in a place that was very rural, but they probably were well enough off by the standards of their day, and they certainly were able to feed themselves. Now, some scholars note that the Bible says Mary was there at the wedding, whereas it says Jesus was invited. It might not mean anything, but they speculate that she was part of the administration of the festivities. Again, there's no way of knowing, but as we'll see, when a problem does arise, she tries to help. Now, it's strange, isn't it, that Jesus' disciples were invited? The way the Greek is phrased, the emphasis is on Jesus. It's kind of like saying Jesus was invited along with his disciples. So maybe only Jesus was invited, but he could bring guests. But still, that's a little odd, isn't it? I mean, Wyatt and Erica are going to get married soon. And if they invite me, do you think they would think it was a little strange if I showed up with six people they didn't know? Since he was just starting out in his public ministry, and he wasn't a prominent prophet or teacher in any respect yet, we wonder why Jesus was allowed to bring these disciples with him. This privilege, along with Mary possibly being involved in the wedding, leads people to speculate that the wedding couple were a close family friend or relatives of Jesus. But all of that is background. The important fact is that people, family, and friends from all over the nation would come for this celebration, and the festivities could last up to a week. So we'll see that that is important next. Verse 3. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no wine left. Jesus replied, Woman, why are you saying this to me? My time has not yet come. His mother told the servants, Whatever he tells you, do it. Scholar D.A. Carson wrote, A wedding celebration could last as long as a week, and the financial responsibility lay with the groom. To run out of supplies would be a dreadful embarrassment, and there is some evidence that it could also lay the groom open to a lawsuit from aggrieved relatives of the bride. Wow. Now, Leanne and I had a reception that lasted all of three hours, and we did run out of finger sandwiches. All I had was a glass of iced tea. Leanne didn't even get that. But I find it amusing to think that in this culture, Leanne's family could have sued me for embarrassing the family because we ran out of supplies. I don't know. I don't think... Anyone in Leanne's family drinks wine. If we ran out of roasted meat, though, we might have had a problem. Good country folk like their meat. When the wine ran out, Mary came to tell Jesus about it. Why? Was she expecting a miracle? Probably not. Because all indications are Jesus hasn't done any miracles yet. This is his first one this very day. Maybe she thought of Jesus just as a capable, reliable man who, who loved her, and so she shared her burden with him. Who knows? Now, when he answered her, Jesus called his mother woman. And I want you to know that was not rude in this culture to address a woman that way. There's a vocative form of the word, and so you could call a woman woman, and it was okay. But it still is unusual to address your mother that way, so we have to wonder at it. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus seems to be distancing himself from his mother, even as he expresses love for her. And that has led some scholars to, to wonder if maybe he had to convince Mary to see Jesus as her Savior instead of as her son. 
Or maybe he felt like he had to declare that he wouldn't be guided by humans anymore now that he was being guided by the Holy Spirit in his ministry. I don't know. Honestly, I think he was just sassing her a little bit. Like I've been known to sass my mother, always in a non-sinful way. Okay. The Net Bible quotes Jesus asking his mother, Woman, why are you saying this to me? Literally in Greek, what Jesus said was, What to me and to you? This was an idiom in Hebrew that had become common usage in Greek. According to the Net Bible translation notes, if someone asked you to get involved in something that you thought was none of your business, you could use this idiom to say, hey, that's your business, not mine. What do I have to do with this? Jesus also told his mother, my time has not yet come. If Mary wasn't asking for a miracle, then Jesus is answering a more profound question than she asked. The video makes it seem like she knows something special is coming, but I don't know. I can picture my mother rolling her eyes and dismissing what I said and then telling the servants to, I would find some way to help, so to do what I said. But what does Jesus mean? His time has not yet come. This is part of the literary tension in the Gospel of John. The author, John, and Jesus will repeatedly state that Jesus' time has not yet come. His time has not yet come. His time has not yet come. And then suddenly, Jesus will announce that his time has arrived. If you read the whole gospel through, you'll see that pattern. Verse 6. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washing, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. The Jews had a lot of customs to symbolically cover up their defilement from sin. At this wedding, the servants would pour water over the hands of the guests to purify them from this defilement. Each of the six stone water jars held two or three metrites, which is roughly 18 to 27 gallons. Your English Bible likes round numbers, so they almost always say 20 to 30. Now, the need for six water pots with a total of 100 to 150 gallons of water for purification suggests a fairly large guest list, I think. All the more embarrassment if there is no more wine. Now we get to some action. Verse 7. Jesus told the servants, fill the water jars with water. So they filled them up to the very top. Then he told them now, Draw some out and take it to the head steward. And they did. When the head steward tasted the water that had been turned to wine, not knowing where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the cheaper wine when the guests are drunk. You have kept the good wine until now. We really are talking about wine, not grape juice. We know that from biblical descriptions, external historical documentation, archaeological evidence of wine use in this culture. And even in this passage, it's clear that at such festivities, some guests would become drunk or intoxicated. Now, what's funny, or maybe it's not funny, really, it's kind of disturbing, is that many of our English translations will take great pains to avoid saying this. So they use other terminology like the guests having drunk freely or having drunk a lot or having well drunk. But the Greek verb methusko means to cause somebody to be inebriated or intoxicated. And we shouldn't deny that. We should never deny something God has revealed to be true. If we don't like it, then we need to explain it. Now to be sure, they were drinking wine that was diluted to between one-third and one-tenth of its fermented strength. And because it was so diluted, people could drink more of it without becoming intoxicated. Of course, that creates a bigger problem for the groom because he has to provide that much more volume of wine to drink. Also, to be sure, Jesus was not condoning drunkenness. Jesus always obeyed God's law, which prohibited drunkenness. In fact, when we were studying Genesis, we noted that Noah's drunkenness after the ark is parallel in the biblical narrative to Adam and Eve taking guidance from the snake. In each case, 
they allowed creation to influence them instead of listening to God and representing God to the rest of creation. Also, it's worth noting here that there's nothing in this text that says at this celebration people were getting drunk. Just the implication that that could happen sometimes at wedding festivities. And I think we all know that to be true already. Now, according to the head steward, Jesus made excellent wine. Are you surprised? I'm not. Even if you put aside his perfection, I think Jesus is one of those people that probably pursued excellence in everything he did. From where did the servants draw the water that became the wine? In the video, and I think in every story I've ever seen about this scene, we assume that they drew the water out of the stone water jars. But the Greek verb antleo could suggest they drew more out of the well. Either way, we have to wonder how much water was turned into wine, right? If they drew it out of the water pot, was it just a ladleful that became wine? Or was it one pot? Or was it all 100 plus gallons that became wine that day? As we'll see in a moment, when we're talking about the significance of the miracle, if Jesus was symbolizing his own provision under the new covenant, as well as helping the groom avoid embarrassment, then he would have provided plenty of wine. Let's finish our text and then we'll talk about what it means. Verse 11. Jesus did this as the first of his miraculous signs in Cana of Galilee. In this way, he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. So when the wedding celebration was over, with his family and his disciples, Jesus went down out of the hills to Capernaum, which was a city right on the Sea of Galilee. And that would become his home base for his ministry while he was in Galilee. But before going, Jesus did this first of his miraculous signs, turning water into wine. And this first miraculous sign concluded Jesus' first week of ministry, according to the time hints given in the Gospel of John. It was not a grand act for everyone to see. It was subtle. The setting wasn't the temple or a palace. It was at a country wedding for common folk in an obscure small village in Galilee. I wonder what that says, that that's the miracle Jesus started with. There is significant symbolism associated with this miracle, as you'd expect. Many of the messianic promises God had given to Israel await final fulfillment for when Christ returns. But while he walked the earth, Jesus gave these signs to show that he is the Christ who will bring fulfillment of these promises. The prophets foretold a time of deliverance when wine would be plentiful in Israel because of the provision of the Messiah. So this sign miracle pointed to what we've already heard from John, both Johns, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the promised deliverer for Israel. The wedding also holds symbolism. As we'll see in a couple of weeks, John the Baptist will refer to Jesus as a bridegroom. In his book Revelation, the apostle John reveals that the church is the bride of Christ. Paul also elaborated on the relationship between Christ and the church as bridegroom and bride. At this wedding, Jesus made good the deficiency of the bridegroom's provision in anticipation of the perfect way that he would provide while fulfilling his role as bridegroom to the church, supplying us with salvation, cleansing, spiritual renewal, and spiritual protection. Even the water pots are significant. With his death, Jesus was ushering in a new era in the relationship between God and people, one that he and the prophets before him called the new covenant. 
The water pots being filled to the brim before the miracle might symbolize that the time for ritual purification in water was fulfilled. And now began a time to draw purification from a new source. In this new covenant, Jesus offers us permanent cleansing before God. By grace, through faith in Him. As we hear when taking communion, at the Last Supper, before His crucifixion, Jesus used wine to symbolize ushering in this new covenant by His blood sacrifice on the cross. This first miracle indicates that the new covenant era was at hand. The prophets had spoken of the new covenant as far back as Moses when he was still writing the old covenant. God promised this new covenant would include cleansing us so that we could love Him properly. God transforming us so that we could obey Him. God forgiving us permanently and completely. God sending the Holy Spirit to indwell us. And ultimately, God restoring Israel. We enjoy a partial fulfillment of this covenant now, and we will see it fully fulfilled when Jesus returns. Doing this miracle, Jesus thus revealed a hint of His glory, His majesty, and the disciples believed in Him. Now, not all who saw the miracle are said to believe, but those who knew Jesus, even for a few days, and who had faith in God, they saw the miracle, and they believed in Jesus. So what do we learn about Jesus this week? It's a shorter list than usual, right? We've had like 10 things on there some weeks. John's been packing us with information. But we learn <clears throat> that Jesus is powerful enough to do miracles, even to change nature, creation, a hint at what we've already learned, that Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the bridegroom to the church, sacrificially providing for his bride, salvation, cleansing, protection, really everything she would need. And Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, who will fulfill God's promises to deliver Israel to peace and prosperity, and who brings the new covenant blessings now, including permanent cleansing in God's sight. Now, I hope you'll take some time this week to reflect on all that we've learned about Jesus. We've covered, what, like two pages in your Bible, right? But we've learned a lot in five weeks. I ask you to reflect on it this week because reflection is so important for spiritual renewal and spiritual growth. Studies show that if you reflect and study the same content as the sermon, you can get up to 900% more out of the sermon than just sitting here. Now, if I offered you an investment with up to a 900% return, you'd at least investigate it, right? So give it a try. Get your Bible open this week to John chapter 1 and John chapter 2. Grab the handouts and the devotions. If you don't have them, if you haven't been using them, that's fine, but they're still on the internet, available for free. Take a look. Start making some notes for yourself that you could share with other people. Like John said, we don't want the heritage of the gospel to end with us. We have an obligation to pass it on. So make some notes. And prayerfully think about who Jesus is, because that's all we've been talking about. Think about who Jesus is and what that means for you. How should we respond to all this that we're learning about Jesus? If Jesus is the one, the one and only, who can secure for us provision and deliverance, how should we respond to him? Well, the first step, of course, is to believe, right? Just like those early disciples. Believe in these truths. Believe in who Jesus is. Believe that he is the divine son who came to earth to fulfill all of God's prophetic promises as the Messiah, the Christ. 
Put your faith in Jesus and who he really is and in what he therefore was able to accomplish for you in his crucifixion and resurrection. And second, if you believe these theological truths, if you believe them, let them change you. Let them change who you are. If Jesus provides you with permanent cleansing in God's sight, unconditional forgiveness, salvation by grace, then you should never have to wallow in guilt, right? You should never succumb to insecurity about who you are. You should never let the opinions of other people affect your own self-image. Please don't ever doubt that God loves you. If Jesus delivers you to new spiritual life, a life of vitality, purpose, and hope, then you should never let the circumstances of your life defeat you. Many of us have suffered and struggled in the past year that I've been here. I know that. But don't let it defeat you. If this is true about the life Jesus gives us, then we should never find ourselves drifting aimlessly through our life, right? And we should never choose to dwell in a temporal, materialistic perspective. Please don't ever doubt that God is with you and empowering you for whatever he has for you to do. If Jesus is all that we say he is and you believe in him, then you should sense growth over time in the passion of your love for him, in the confidence of your trust in him, in the depth and breadth of your obedience to him. We asked last week, what are you seeking from Jesus? I hope some of you reflected on that. I encourage you to keep thinking about that. What are you seeking from Jesus? Just as John shows us each week that Jesus is much more than most of us ever conceived, we will also find that Jesus offers us much more than we ever conceived. So pray for, pray for it, seek it, and if you need help, don't be afraid to ask for it. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for coming. It is amazing what we've been learning. All the ways in the Old Testament that it spoke of you as the greater Moses prophet, as the Messiah, God's ultimate king, as the Son of Man, God's ultimate representative and authority on the earth. You are the Son of God, your Savior, Deliverer, the Eternal High Priest, the Judge anointed by God the Father, the greatest prophet ever, the ultimate Davidic King. So many different ways that the Bible has identified you and you came and gave signs to show that this is who you were. And in this text, you did a miracle. You changed creation. And in doing that, you gave a symbol, a symbol of what was to come, of this new kind of purification that you would offer. Purification by your blood, not by water. Jesus, help us to believe in who you are and to understand it. And help us to be excited about it. So excited that we have to tell somebody, just like those first disciples did, hey, we found the Christ. We know who he is. I want that excitement in my heart. I want that joy and that peace of knowing that whatever's happening right now in my life, I know what's to come. I have hope because I know that you will deliver us. Lord, as we build through John each week, help our faith to grow. We love you. We thank you. We pray that all that we're doing here this morning would be glorious for you, a blessing for you. 
Amen.